Hello and welcome back. After that uh, short break, we're going to start off our third session of the ninth annual Mitchell Sustainability Symposium. Uh, before I introduce Anaga, a couple of notes. As an attendee, your video and audio uh, is deactivated. The chat feature is also turned off. The Q&A is active, so please put, uh, as you're listening, please put questions into that and we will moderate those. Uh, we are not allowing anonymous questions, but if you do have anonymous feedback, please go to our website and you can provide that uh, in a form, a Qualtrics form that we have there online. Um, I will now get us going. Uh, Anaga Kikiri is the current president of UT Student Government and will introduce President Jay Hartzell. Anaga is a senior government major in liberal arts honors from Dallas, Texas. She grew up in an area where diversity and inclusion was significantly lacking, which shaped her priorities throughout college and led her to become the inaugural vice president of diversity and inclusion for the University Pan-Hellenic Council. Anaga ran with Winston Hung and their platform focused on inclusion and equity, engagement, health, Longhorn pride, safety, and sustainability. Anaga, thank you for being here with us today. Turn it over to you. Thank you, Jim. And thank you so much to the President's Sustainability Steering Committee and the Office of Sustainability for inviting UT Student Government to be a part of this Sustainability Symposium. So before I introduce President Hartzell, I want to speak about sustainability generally and its importance to myself and to student government this year. So as we know, climate change and general sustainability issues have been an ever-growing issue in the entire world. And when I was forming my platform to run for student vice president with Winston, who is vice president, we wanted to ensure that we focused on advocating for increased sustainable practices at UT. And this primarily came to the form of ensuring that all students were educated, informed, and plugged into the amazing resources that UT has to offer. So furthermore, our amazing sustainability co-director, Sri and Deepthi, have worked tirelessly to ensure that sustainability was part of the student activism narrative on campus. And one of the most valuable conversations they have sparked is the intersection of diversity, equity, and inclusion measures and sustainability practices, coinciding with many policies we believe will lead UT and the broader Texas community to the future. So on a personal anecdote, fighting for diversity, equity, and inclusion is my true passion, and it would be remiss for me to say that sustainability is not deeply intertwined with diversity, equity, and inclusion. As such an intersectional issue in society, sustainability affects marginalized groups the most and, you can, and cannot be ignored as we examine economic, social, and racial justice. Once you realize that issues of sustainability are greater than just going green, um, then you realize that it's something, and you realize it's something that permeates through and touches everything we examine, not just in student advocacy or on the university level, but as an entire society. In all, I'm so excited and hopeful to hear about all the hard work sustainability efforts um, at, of sustainability efforts at UT and look forward to what the future holds. And now I'm pleased to introduce President Jay Hartzell. President Hartzell is the 30th president of the University of Texas at Austin. He holds the Tramel Crow Regents Professorship in Business. He is also a Texas ex. Prior to serving as president, Hartzell served as the 12th Dean of the Macomb School of Business, one of the largest and most distinguished business schools in the country. He helped create many significant partnerships with colleges and schools across the campus, including the Dell Medical School, the College of Fine Arts, the College of Liberal Arts, the College of Natural Sciences, and the Moody College of Communication. He also established the position of Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at the McComb School and the McCombs Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Hartzell holds a Bachelor in Science in Business Administration and Economics from Trinity University and a PhD in Finance from the University of Texas at Austin. His research focuses on real estate finance, corporate finance, and corporate governance. Before being appointed as interim president this past June, Hartzell was serving as the chair, uh, as the chair of the UT Austin President Sustainability Steering Committee. He was first appointed to the Sustainability Committee by President Greg Fenbez in 2017. So please join me in a virtual welcome for President Hartzell. Great. Thanks, Anika. It's good to see you, and uh, thanks for the kind introduction and, and for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. And uh, it's a pleasure to join you all today. Um, and before I get going, I want to recognize Dean Paul Goldbart, Dean Claudia Mora, uh, the Office of Sustainability, and the members of the President's Sustainability Steering Committee for organizing the symposium. I attended it last year as a guest, and it's a pleasure to be on 
on this side of it this year as well. And I'm a big fan of the PSSC and was grateful to serve on it for several years. And although last year I was chair of it and uh, look what happened to me. So I don't know what this says about uh, what uh, fate holds in store for, for Dean Goldbart or Dean Mora, but I would look out. Um, thank you again to the Mitchell Foundation for uh, their ongoing support for sustainable education here at the university. Not only do you support UT in these endeavors, but you also support the very future of our planet by enabling us to equip future leaders. And looking out at who signed up uh, to attend this event today, I know some of you are those future leaders. It's great to see so many people joining us, especially students who are passionate about the environment and how we can be better stewards of it. This is the ninth sustainability symposium the university has hosted. And it's clear that over the last decade, the conversation around sustainability, both here on campus and in the world outside has changed. There are new voices and new stakeholders, and this means new opportunities, but also the need for new ways of communicating with each other. Today, I wanna to focus on that communication because it's the key, I believe, to how we approach the new global conversation. So let me give you an example of, of what I mean. Uh, earlier this year, we opened a new robotics lab here on campus. The lab plays a, a key role in the university's emerging partnership with the Army Futures Command. One of the things the Army Futures Command likes to say is, tomorrow is worth protecting. I bring this up because that slogan could equally describe our push for more sustainable campus or our grave concerns in regard to the climate or the drive for greater environmental justice around the world. But the resonance goes beyond the use of slogans. In fact, some of the most impressive iterations of green technology today are being driven by the US military. This process really got going when the war in Afghanistan was near its peak around 2009. At that point, energy consumption was a primary concern, in particular because of the delivery of fossil fuels to remote locations and bases and outposts. It was estimated at that time that seven gallons of fuel were expended in the process of delivering one gallon of fuel to the front. 40% of the fuel that got to a base was poured into generators that powered electrical systems. In other words, it was costing up to $400 per gallon to keep the lights on. A decade later, and green technology is at the heart of the military preparedness. Solar panels, biofuels, recycling programs, hybrid and electric vehicles, such technologies are emerging at the center of military planning. Now, my point here is simple. There are new players in the world of sustainability, and they might not be who you think, and they might have different motivations for being in the conversation. The questions are, can you collaborate with them and can you commun communicate with them? It's not just in the world of military preparedness that sustainability is becoming more important. I come from corporate finance, as Anika mentioned in my bio, and one of the big buzzwords or acronyms in corporate America is ESG, Environmental, Social, and Corporate Governance. There's been a huge growth in funds that specialize in investing in firms based on their ESG practices, implying that more environmentally aware corporations might also have more investors, higher stock prices, and the like. I taught real estate for several years. At an early conference I attended, an apartment developer was asked if he'd ever built LEED certified apartments. He said he'd painted an apartment door green once. Years later, I attended another conference where developers said they were building the LEED standards because they were worried that non-LEED buildings would be tough to sell in five years. So you can see that transition over that time. The Business Roundtable, which is an important group of US companies, garnered a lot of attention last year when they came out with a proposed and controversial change to the goals of a corporation. It was no longer, in their view, just maximizing shareholder value. They said, quote, Supporting the communities in which we work, we respect the people in our communities and protect the environment by embracing sustainable practices across our businesses. And then they went on to say, each of our stakeholders is essential. We commit to deliver value to all of them for the future success of our companies, our communities, and our country. Now here at Texas, at the UT system level, we see the growth of investments in renewable sources of energy. Last month, UT lands which manage many of the energy operations that help fund academic programs here on campus, reported to the Board of Regents, three no, new solar projects under construction, around 70,000 acres of solar and wind leases across West Texas. That's enough to power 300,000 Texas homes. According to their report, environmental responsibility and transparency of producing companies continues to increase through a combination of voluntary efforts and public shareholder demands. UT Land's future priorities include further and significantly increase wind and solar and water infrastructure development. All of these examples point to new voices in the conversations, but for many, they also point to the sort of existential dilemma. How do you go about collaborating and communicating with those who have shared goals, but
but perhaps different motivations. For example, sustainability in the military is driven primarily by preparedness rather than environmental concerns. According to former US Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mavis, such efforts cut costs and, cut, and keep fuel from being used as a weapon against us. I would hazard a guess that many of our students here at UT are interested in sustainability issues for different reasons. Hearing new voices in the conversation can be unsettling and you may even greet them with suspicion. It's a bit like when an indie band starts and you, they, they get started and you like them and they become popular. Have they gone mainstream? Have they sold out? Sure, people may like the hits, but do they listen to the album tracks? Should I keep listening? Ultimately, you stick with the band because you like what, love what they do and you want them to succeed, right? In the same vein, we need to welcome new voices and interest to the conversation around sustainability. They represent practical opportunities to further causes we believe in. And I'm not sure what value we provide to those causes if we treat new voices as an existential threat. So we have new voices, interests, and hopefully new opportunities. What do we do next? Well, to master this changing landscape, we need new skills. And there's no better place to learn them than here at the University of Texas. Why UT? Three words, operations, research, and teaching. First, when it comes to sustainability, UT is a big place. When it comes to sustainability, we're not a small liberal arts college trying to cut down on photocopying. We're talking about 50,000 students, over 20,000 faculty and staff on nearly 1,000 acres between the Maine and Pickle Research campuses. We operate our own power stations. Over 5 million rides are taken annually on the UT shuttle system. The Jester dormitory alone serves over 30,000 meals per day. 90% of our water flows into the Waller, Waller Creek watershed, which stretches over a mile through campus. And I'm proud of the progress we're making. In 2019, UT's campus reached 3 million square feet, 3.6 million square feet of LEED certified buildings. That's 20% of the LEED certified building space in the city of Austin. Because our utility operations strive for efficiency, UT's carbon footprint is now the same as it was in 1976, despite our growth in power needs that have more than doubled since then. We have 7,000 bicycle parking spaces on campus and 1,000 people participate in our carpooling program. And of course, we have our own dedicated Office of Sustainability to make sure we keep tabs on all this and keep pushing forward. In part for that, I also want to give a shout out and a thanks to Jim Walker, who did just a great job. It was good to see Jim on, the, on this uh, webinar here today. My point is, because of our size and scale, we have a unique capacity to lead on sustainability issues, to be a living laboratory for new ideas and ventures, as well as a hub for experiential learning. We've seen these dynamics in play during COVID. We've managed to navigate the pandemic, creating a safe and meaningful hybrid learning experience for our students. On the first day of online classes last March, we went from an almost entirely in-person university to one that delivered 8 million minutes of Zoom in that first day alone. We've partnered with the city of Austin, the state of Texas on everything from public health communication to epidemi epidemiological modeling. We've researched and leveraged our research capabilities on campus to contribute to scientific progress. Jason McClellan's an example of this. And if you haven't followed the story, you should look it up and, and read about him. He's just done remarkable work. We recruited Jason away from the Dartmouth Medical School to come to the University of Texas at Austin. He was at the time, one of the world's experts in coronaviruses. Then COVID-19 hits and Jason and his team build the world's first three-dimensional model of the spike protein that COVID-19 uses to attack us. That work is now at the backbone of four of the five top vaccine candidates, including the Pfizer and Moderna work. So you can see the kind of impact that UT research is having in the fight against COVID-19 and beyond. Finally, let me also take a moment to thank all of the staff, many of whom are in the services portfolio of our CFO, Daryl Bazell, who spoke with you earlier. The work they have all done this year is just incredible. So when it comes to climate change, I know we have the resources and resilience here at the university to play our part to be part of the solution. We say here, what starts here changes the world. So it goes without saying that what starts here can change the climate too. That's because UT is the size of a small city. It's just like a small city with the smartest city council ever. That brings us to research. We're, we are a tier one research university with over 3000 faculty drawn from all over the world. We have so many different perspectives that can be brought to bear, so many lines of expertise that can be tapped. We've seen this in action with our Bridging Barriers Initiative, 
Planet Texas 2050. Over 100 faculty have come together to work on the project to understand what will Texas look like in 2050. A Texas with twice as many people as today and with more extreme weather events. A Texas that will juggle so many different demands from water to energy to transportation. Their efforts are joined by thousands of community partners to discuss how Texas develops its cities, orients its infrastructure, and manages its resources to create a sustainable future. We must rise to meet these challenges. But in meeting the needs of Texas, we will also meet the needs of others. Texas is in many ways representative of the future, a bellwether for global trends. What we will learn through Project 2050 will have an impact beyond our great state. What starts here will change the world. And finally, on the research front, it's clear today that our students as well as our faculty are deeply involved. Just look at the showcase of research taking place this afternoon. Aquaponics, energy consumption, smart irrigation, the impact of COVID on campus consumption, just to name a few. This is why we're increasing our investment in sustainability education on campus so that we can equip our students who lack nothing in desire with the skills they need to support the causes they believe in. And this brings us to teaching. At every turn, sustainability is advancing through our teaching mission. It's increasingly woven throughout the student experience. Since it was established in 2015, 116 students have matriculated with a bachelor's degree in sustainability studies. Today, over 300 students are on course to join them. I would remiss not to mention the work of the Mitchell Foundation in helping us get there. Since 2013, the foundation has supported the Sustainability Course Development Awards Program, which led to the creation of over 30 new or modified courses across 17 departments on campus. Now, 80% of UT's academic departments offer sustainability courses. In total, over 250 graduate and undergraduate courses here at UT are focused on sustainability, while over 2,500 include content on sustainability. It is estimated that 14,000 students are taking sustainability courses. And you know, as the former business school dean, that some of the courses and things I'm excited about involve business communication. So to bring this together, how do we knit together our knowledge, our ethics and ideas so that we can advance better stewardship of the environment? A significant part of the answer lies in how we combine business, communication and sustainability. I believe this is the key moving forward. Pardon the wordplay, but sustainability is not sustainable over the long run if the economic case can't be made. And if organizations can't communicate about the costs and benefits of sustainability driven decisions to stakeholders. Government subsidies and moral appeals will only get us so far. This isn't negative or fatalistic. Economic forces are acting to move us toward a more sustainable world. When we conceptualize sustainability as a business opportunity, when we utilize communication to get that message across, we advance the cause. On the business side, that means fostering sustainable enterprise. We need to build the business perspective into why we do what we do. This is how we can unleash the power of innovation, capital markets, supply chains, and workforce structures to drive solutions on a global scale. If our graduates prefer to work for companies with strong sustainability missions, that means those organizations will either be able to pay less for the same talent or pay the same for greater talent. If customers prefer products of sustainable firms, that means they'll pay more for those goods, generating revenue and covering the costs of the firm's activities. If investors realize these things, they'll provide more capital more readily to those firms. All of these provides incentives for firms to be more sustainable, as long as the benefits outweigh the costs. So over time, sustainability activities will grow as the benefits from sustainability increase, more workers, more consumers and investors who care, and or as the costs of sustainability decrease, for example, due to innovation in solar panel technology. This engine for change is far more powerful over the long run, in my opinion, than regulation or subsidization. I'll give you one very brief example from our own organization. Did you realize there are over 4,871 trees on campus that produce annual ecological benefits the total $541,038. By communicating information like this, we add arrows to our quiver. All of a sudden, we're speaking business as well as ethics. We're building coalitions. We're framing an environmental issue as an invitation rather than indignation. But to do this, data has to be collected, tabulated, and then communicated. This is why business and communication skills are vital 
in the sustainability arena moving forward. The end game here is to develop leaders who can speak to both business leaders and environmentalists, as well as everyone in between. We need people who can speak the language of both the boardroom and the laboratory. We need people who can resonate with shareholders as well as the placard holders. We need people who can accurately and forcefully convey the facts on sustainability so those tenets take root and become common practice. One of the latest things that I'm really happy that's happening at the university is our Sustainability and Leadership Institute. Thanks to the generosity of the Bake Family Trust, represented by Chris and Cynthia Bake, UT is creating a new Sustainability and Leadership Institute. The Institute is, part, is a partnership between the Macomb School of Business and the Moody College of Communication. Part of the Institute's work will be to create a new minor in sustainability and leadership. Students will learn about ESG investing, sustainability accounting and reporting, social entrepreneurship, corporate social responsibility, environmental reporting, as well as how to communicate scientific knowledge and technological solutions to public audiences. I'm really pumped that this is happening here at UT. Texas has a full gamut of energy opportunities from oil and gas to wind and solar. So it makes sense that we would lead the way in cultivating the next generation of energy leaders. As I said earlier, our size and scope, our research and our teaching make UT a natural incubator for a whole generation of leaders in sustainability. So I leave you with a set of questions. Can you embrace a world of unlikely allies? Can you be a translator, a bridge builder? Can you become one of those leaders? In March, 2019, former Texas governor Rick Perry surprised many people. He actually agreed with US representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AKA the notorious AOC. At the time, Perry was the secretary for energy, having been appointed to that post by President Donald Trump. Meanwhile, AOC has been advocating strongly, and it must be said pointedly, for the Green New Deal, much to the chagrin of many Republicans in Trump and Perry's party. Perry's comments caught many off guard. He said, quote, I don't think the representative should be castigated or pushed aside just on the face of her comments relative to what she wants, that she wants to live in a place with clean air and water, he said at the time. So do I, how can we get there? Later, members of the press asked him if he was willing to meet AOC. He said he would be agreeable and adding, and I quote, life is too short to be pissed off all the time. I don't think you could imagine two more unlikely allies, could you? But the reality is, regardless of our personal politics, our experiences and professional pursuits, we all wanna live in places with clean air and water. We can have shared interests, even when we don't always seem to have shared values. And I think life indeed is, to quote Rick Perry again, too short to be pissed off all the time. More importantly, our planet doesn't have enough time for us to be pissed off all the time. Instead, we need to be moving forward all the time. So I wanna leave you with the words of Brene Brown who gave our commencement address earlier this year and who's a visiting professor at the Macomb School, we should, in her words, dare to lead. That means daring to have difficult conversations, but also welping, welcoming new voices to those conversations. It means daring to bring business and ethics together in new and creative ways, while also rejecting the false dichotomy that is often peddled between the two. And it means learning new skills, languages, and concepts. We need to expand sustainability from merely an ethic or an emotion into a way of communicating that means something to the business world. We need to instill a new way of thinking among investors, shareholders, clients, and customers. We can do it. We've seen it with COVID here on campus. We leverage their talents, their knowledge, research, and teaching to get the, to the heart of issues. Then we listen, collaborate, communicate, and find solutions together. This is part of what it means to be a Longhorn. This is what it means to dare to lead. Thank you. I'll stop there and open up for some questions. Well, thank you, uh, President Hartsville. That that was that was great. Uh, we're going to get some questions teed up here in the Q and A uh, chat. I do want to. I'll lead off with a few questions here to get us going. Um, the you mentioned the Mitchell Foundation, and we're very thankful for their long term uh, investments. That the uh, the gift from the Bake uh, family for the Sustainability Leadership Institute is very exciting. And I'm, I'm curious if over the coming years, if you see uh, increasing interest from the foundation and, and corporate partners uh, of the university for investing in sustainability initiatives. It's just kind of a, it's just the beginning of a growth trend for that kind of uh, support. I think so. I think so. And Jim, and you look at all the, the trends in society and 
Um, you know, we're surrounded by some incredibly talented young people around campus. And, you know, to everything I see, you look at in general, the kinds of products uh, people want to buy more and more, young people especially, kinds of firms where they want to work, uh, the kinds of organizations, the kinds of values and, and spirit they have. And that's, that's, I think, only going to continue to develop and, and evolve. And so a lot of our support um, are, is coming from people who want to position our students to be ready for this and to be in position. That was largely uh, the, the Bakes idea. And many companies are also thinking, how can they get in front of this, not only from the corporate standpoint, but from the standpoint of recruiting talent. And we're a top provider of talent in the country. And those companies want access uh, to the talent that we produce. And so getting more support from those kinds of organizations, I think will be part of their thesis about how to have, not only make an impact on the world around them, but also um, have a way to, to appeal to some really smart people uh, that come out of our institution. And uh, your, your points about unlikely allies and, and, and being willing um, and actually seeking out those kind of difficult conversations, I think there's kind of multiple facets to that, right? We, we know from students, staff, and faculty of their interest in, in climate change and emissions planning, uh, and that that's a difficult conversation and needs and has many voices. And I think part of what you're saying is that as we talk about emissions planning, we need to welcome voices to that. And then uh, I think some would say a flip side of that coin is the divestment uh, question or kind of this, the, the way that we are connected to fossil fuels. And we talked a lot about that in some of the earlier sessions and acknowledged that it's complicated, it would take time, uh, it's, it's much bigger than just the UT Austin institution. But I think that that unlikely allies, difficult conversations, all of that applies to that side of the coin as well. And so the, the question is, as we kind of go over with this plan update, what does um, having an action oriented, authentic, difficult conversation kind of look like? And, and how do you know that that's what you're doing and that's what you, that's where you're driving? Yeah, I, I guess um, to me, part of it would be um, looking around at who's in the room with you and who's talking to whom. And if you're all, if everybody has the same kind of background, the same kind of training, same exact perspectives, um, then you're probably you know closer on the continuum to more like an echo chamber where you're all agreeing with each other. And, and that, that, that is an obviously needed first step often, but really to make these leaps, I think it's making the tent bigger and, and trying to find people that have different points of view. And, you know, candidly, when you called me to, to, to ask about the PSSC, um, you know, at the time I was thinking, well, I'm a business school professor. Why would you, a business school dean, why would you want me? And that's an example of that, you know, where we've got um, people that far know far more about the technical side of the science and, and, and the environmental impacts and that than, than somebody from the business school would. But on the other hand, people in the business school are, are increasingly interested in um, how, you know, take the, the, the investment stuff you mentioned. Uh, if, if companies can appeal to more investors, um, whatever that looks like, they're gonna have higher stock prices, lower cost of capital, more ability to take on projects. So, so it's getting that, those kinds of cross conversations, I think often between the, the, the technical experts who have the scientific expertise to help lead the way and people who can figure out organizationally how to make things happen. And then you've got people who can serve as a communication funnel and help get those stories out in the public. And so um, I, I think back to your question, it, it comes down a lot to checking out who's in the room and making sure um, that we have diverse points of view uh, that are all being allowed to take you know, their own angle of a problem so we can find something in common as a way forward. I think, I think that'll be a big part of the steering committee in the, in the campus work over the next, I guess, few months. Uh, I'm gonna pull up one of the questions here that in the Q&A about the largest uh, carbon uh, reduction effort in the last several years that we've been able to measure. And then I'll ask you a question about um, kind of the, the carbon emissions of campus and, and you're aware of the faculty council uh, question to the steering committee while you were chair about looking at emissions planning but in, in recent years, really the, the largest contributor to keeping our greenhouse gas emissions as low as possible has been the work of the utility and the energy management optimization group. 
on the demand side efforts, meaning all of the consumption that happens in the buildings. Uh, and they're doing an amazing amount of work on that front. And, and, and I would be remiss to say the, the way that we're operating the chilling stations and the, the power plant are also contributing to keeping our emissions as low as possible. Um, but that is still a natural gas uh, power plant. And it, it, again, it was noted earlier about the, the need to look at natural gas as both uh, the benefits that it has brought to the university, the amount of infrastructure we have in it, but also recognizing the, um, the transition that seems to be coming forward. So are there opportunities in your mind, just, just for the conversation going forward, like over the next 10, 15 years for that, that kind of conversation? Yeah, I think so. And, and you know, I, you think about where the campus is going and even if we don't have dramatic changes in the number of students, which we don't foresee, uh, for all the reasons we've been talking about, we've seen already, there's, there's no more need for, for power, for energy. And, you know, just, just and you and I have talked about it, just the supercomputing needs alone, the computing needs requires a lot of cooling. And so there's a, there's a, just a, a, the needs on campus are not gonna, I think, flatten out, we're gonna continue to grow. And then that's gonna cause us all to have to talk through questions about how do we satisfy those needs to keep up our teaching and research missions. And you know, the main thing that I, I think is the right way to approach it is to lay the trade-offs off out on the table. And, and it might be that hypothetically at this moment in time, one source of, of energy might be cheaper than another, but then there's other things about, well, there are other objectives we're trying to solve. We want you know, things to be reliable or flexible or accommodate growth. Um, and the, the environmental impacts would be part of that same conversation about pros and cons of things. And part of why I'm excited, not only I think those are important conversations, but I think it's important for us as a campus to remember those moments and think about them and, and ways we can involve students in those conversations. Because I think it's an amazing learning opportunity uh, for, for people to be around that and see, okay, here's the, the, the problem we're trying to solve uh, for now, for the next few years, for example, and here are the various trade-offs we're all considering and how do we put some, some way of weighing those things against each other to make a decision. So, um, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I think, I think that's the, those are the kinds of things we're gonna have to sort through and it's, they're complicated because there might be a very immediate short run answer that, that may in some way differ with the trends that we, we expect things to be going in, a, in the medium to long run. Um, and so it's, they're, they're hard problems, otherwise they wouldn't be worth teaching. Um, yeah, right, they wouldn't be worth uh, trying, to, trying to solve. That's right. And That's right. What you're describing there is, is also another theme that's echoed through the day is this idea of transparency. And so you kind of laid out this a way of talking about the trade-offs uh, and being open to kind of all that that means um, so that we are getting beyond just talking about it or doing performative sustainability, but actually trying to you know, walk the talk of, of all this. And I think, I think students are really looking for that as well. And, and to pivot into uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, we've talked a lot today about bringing environmental justice and social equity uh, deeper into the curriculum. I know you've made, a, made several kind of commitments and initiative launch over the last several months. Uh, do you have any kind of thoughts at this point about the overlaps you see between sustainability and diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and social equity issues? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think it, it is an interesting question to think about how these things um, overlap and, and you know, you could start with the case that it's probably uh, many people in our community, uh, including the two of us, care about both, right? So there's there's a there's part of it is just where our values are and what we're trying to trying to think through. Um, the, another thing that that strikes me, I go back to the way corporate America is often approaching this, this idea of um, ESG and the other acronym you'll hear is CSR, corporate social responsibility. And often those same planks or platforms that companies are thinking about how they run their businesses, uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion work is in many ways part of those same conversations alongside sustainability practices. So it's part of a set of things that they're considering in a unified way. That's another sense in which I think organizations are struggling with both and trying to make advances on both. The, uh, another part I've thought about as far as similarity, you know, in, in, in corporate, and because I, I come from the business side of things, you know, we talk about horizontals and verticals and you've got, think about a vertical as a product. So our, our in, a, in a higher education context, 
you've got the undergrad pro undergraduate program in a certain school and the a graduate program and the research that we do, you know, for example. And I think um, in many cases, because many places are still learning and they need to make pretty quick progress, uh, both of these key issues, sustainability or, or DEI, have been framed as another vertical. We're going to have a set of initiatives that are standing alone around these important things. And I, in the, the, in, in the, in the lingo, the horizontals are things that span across all those, all those things. So, you know, finance could be a, a, a horizontal because it's the finance of the undergrad program, et cetera. And I think the transition we're going to eventually see is more organizations get to where sustainability and DEI are horizontals, that it's no longer necessarily a separate sort of bucket of, of priorities and agendas, but it's interwoven into what we do. That, that when we think about anything that we're doing, one of the lenses that we look at or one of the concerns or one of the issues we sort through in whatever it is we're working on today is whether it's DEI or sustainability. And, and I, I think uh, we'll I, I know some organizations are going more that way um, where it's infused in the organization rather than being kind of a separate thing. And I think both will end up being more in that sort of just fabric of, of what, what takes place. I think that kind of resonates with some of how the steering committee is looking at the plan update and, and some of what was discussed uh, this morning. Um, related to that, some questions we got in the pre-registration um, uh, work related to sustainability education, and you, and you touched on the expansion of the, of the minor and the leadership institute, which is, again, just a fabulous thing to hear. Uh, we had a question about uh, a new degree on education and sustainable development specific to the College of Education, but more broadly, you know, these degrees seem to be well uh, sought after by students in high demand. Uh, I think de degree creation may take a while but you know, thoughts on um, more of more minors or other degrees being kind of amended or created that are focused on sustainability and DEI, or have those things embedded. Sure, sure. I and I, um, you know, I don't know enough about every where every college's mindset. Right. So <laughs> I, I'll talk more philosophically and how I thought about it as dean, where I had kind of deeper experience. And um, you know, one thing that that to your point we realize that degrees uh, are bigger lifts. They have more infrastructure, there's more uh, cost to delivering one, there's more kind of just set up and, and that kind of thing. And, um, and so there need, you know, scale has to kind of be there in expectation for it to be, to make sense uh, to go down that path. There's also an external uh, market question. And I don't, I don't just mean, you know, sort of corporate America, but whether it's graduate school or a nonprofit or a for-profit institution, but there, there's often a communication dance between here's what we think we want to study and then how is this going to make sense to the outside world looking in at what we do and how can a, how can a graduate of ours explain and tell their story of, of what they studied. So there's a piece of that that I think we have to also be looking outside to drive things. We could design an amazing program here and then have a difficulty, students could, our graduates could have difficulty explaining it when they went out and that, that would be a, uh, unfortunate. Um, so there's, there's pieces of there around whatever we do. I've found in my experience, minors are easier uh, to start. Uh, there's also, I guess the thing I should also point out are the, the wealth of great opportunities in the Bridge and Discipline program, those kinds of things that, that, that we can bring together. The university, um, and I think we all probably know this, uh, students probably see it as well, but the university's uh, historically been quite siloed and, and units often are kind of doing what they're doing. And things like minors and, and the bridge and dissonance program can be a really good way to span across those silos. So if the question is, how can we bring together courses to create an interdisciplinary set of, of, of things, uh, minors can often get that done more quickly um, in, in many ways. Majors, I think, can be fantastic. The challenge sometimes, I'll just tell you a couple, a couple of roadblocks, not that they're insur not insurmountable, um, not that they are insurmountable, but one is in some places, because the size of a college may be already kind of fixed because they don't have them to grow, you're, it's sort of, a, it's viewed sometimes as competitive, like you're going to take away from existing majors to create this one. So there's a little piece, sometimes it's political, sometimes it's budget, uh, budget challenge, but it has to kind of be navigated to say, 
if these students now pursue this new degree, what, what degrees are no longer gonna, are gonna have fewer students pursue it? And that's just something we kind of all, back to hard conversations. Um, that's something that often has to be sorted through. Um, you know, the other thing is trying to figure out, uh, and this is something I think as university we should do more of, how do we create good incentives for people to want to play well with each other and be willing to put their courses into interdisciplinary programs? Because um, some schools that are that are full or near full, and some departments that are full or near full, it's hard to get sort of seats in those classrooms, right. um, and and it's a challenge. And so, you know, I've done it where I've gone to various. You know, when I back when I was a department chair, I would go to some other uh, some department and say, "Can I have a few seats for our real estate students?" Or and it. it, it and the business school had the same thing. People wanted seats in our classes. So just figuring that all out is, 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 I think, the right kind of work. It's important work, but it can be, it can just take some time. It's going to be kind of hard. Um, so that's a, that's a brain dump. I hope that's helpful. But that's I, I think I think part of I, you've seen a proliferation of minors. Um, it's been a few things. One is, and and many of the students who uh, probably just don't know, but up until a few years ago at UT, minors could not go on transcripts. So certificates could, for whatever reason. And a certificate in our language is sort of a, a minor on steroids. So, so now minors can go on transcripts. So you're seeing a, a, a growth industry in creating minors. And many of our students have just amazing interests across the board. And so the ability to do dual majors or majors with minors is really appealing. And I think it, I think it also sells well to the outside world that they can say, here are the kinds of things I'm interested in beyond my, whatever my major was. So for all those reasons, the minors have taken off. Um, majors are more complicated to get going, but we've seen it and it's happened. And um, it's just, it, it, it's pulling those pieces together is a little bit more challenging. I, right, and that's been our experience over the last several years as well. And I, but I think it's one of the key interest areas for, for students as well as uh, faculty to figure out that complexity. It's one of the opportunities to, to unique, or have one of our unique opportunities to lead, I think. Um, pivoting a little bit again, another question uh, that came up earlier and is also in our Q&A now relates to uh, housing in particular, but, but also kind of applies to auxiliary units that are uh, kind of hammered by, by COVID right now. They're kind of their budgets and business models. And so is there an opportunity in this? And, and we've also had several conversations about learning from the pandemic, you know, being very kind of intentional about you know, right. what, are we, what are we learning and how do we apply that to the future? How do we rethink strategically some of our systems, you know, such as housing and the way that we do graduate and undergraduate housing? Uh, so do you, how are you thinking about some of the learning from the pandemic and how that affects our uh, strategic planning going forward? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating question. And it's one that is going to touch on everything from uh, what it means to work here, uh, how people enjoy that experience, um, traffic, pollution, density. I mean, these, these are all interrelated, affordability. Um, I mean, these are all really tough questions. And, but I, I agree that this is probably um, a lasting impact of COVID is gonna be in, in along these lines. And so I think uh, what you're gonna see more and more units work through, this and now in, in how the university is run, not necessarily the student side, just the way we do what we do. And I think you'll see more and more conversations about, okay, let's hypothetically imagine it's post COVID vaccine, whatever, that stuff is, is behind us. Now, I think we've learned more about how to work remotely. Um, I think we've learned more about how to use technology in, in a good way. Um, people have got, done heroic things to come together to do those, uh, make those things happen. So we, for example, will probably find people more willing to uh, spend more of their weeks working away from campus. And then we got to figure out what functions should still be on campus every day and how does all that work? Those, that has big implications for um, where people choose to live in the long run, and implications for traffic, uh, housing prices, density. Um, so that, that, there's an interesting, there's, that, that's one set. You know, if you overlay that against the long run trends of Austin, Austin's obviously been booming and our median house price now is enormous. And many of our people as a result, uh, between competition between the private sector and the public sector, um, you know, it's, it's, it's gotten a, just a more expensive place to live. And so they're living farther away, they're driving in more. And an answer there traditionally is density. 
and how can you get more density in the city? And that's what's happening in West Campus. Um, you know, I look now out my out my window, and you just see a much different landscape than I, when I was here as a student. And so, how how do we take advantage of that? So we, I, I, there's tons of evidence that all else equal, students do better when they live closer to campus, and uh, they, their attendance rates are better, their completion rates are better, those kinds of things. So so we have to kind of I think work through all that. Um, and there's a lot of new supply going up uh, in housing. And uh, we need to be thoughtful about, is that the right amount of supply for, for our campus? Is it gonna be oversupply, which we might mean we have some opportunities there. Um, we are looking at a couple of opportunities to either build more housing, especially in the graduate space. Um, I will, we, we want- was mentioned to, earlier today yeah, too. Yeah, I think that's important. Um, you know, it, we're starting to move from one of those cities and schools where affordability and the ability to live close to campus was a selling feature to now it's becoming more like an obstacle. And, and, and that has implications, as I said, for everything from recruiting students to faculty and that kind of thing. So it's, it's gonna be, I think, a fertile ground to talk about for the next several years. And, um, and it's, it's, it, it's important, I think, important for us to um, figure out ways to have um, affordable housing close to campus for students and I think it'll also spill over into faculty and staff. Um, I talked to the mayor about it. The mayor, uh, my first phone call with him um, as president, and one of the things he brought up was the more we can get, the more housing we can offer, the way he's thinking about it is it frees up housing units around the city and makes things more affordable for everybody else too. So if we add supply for our, for our community, then it helps Austin. So it's, 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 it feels like we're sort of an inflection point there. And uh, kind of like a, like a last question here and kind of combining a couple of the, the questions. Uh, if there are sustainability initiatives or, or kind of uh, directions or ideas that you have a sense have a strong financial viability or kind of are right or kind of poised, uh, but looking out 10 years from now, you know, thinking about those kind of initiatives today and, and we're doing this plan update over the next several months. And so looking out to 2030 or even 2040, um, what are your aspects of a sustainability vision uh, for UT Austin? What what might it, we look like, or or what would be a cool thing to, to yeah. see done? That's a good question, Jim. And um, I haven't. I I, I I candidly, my head's been down um, the last a lot of the last few months worrying about um, things. And we're just now. I just now feel like we're starting to pop our heads up and look at the horizon again. I guess some things I would think about that I think are important to me, whenever you think about this kind of question about what should be our shared vision in some dimension, I think we should come back to, um, we want to have world-class teaching, world-class research. Um, that's, those are our two you know, primary missions. Um, and then what makes us special? What makes us special, we're in Texas. That has all kinds of implications for this area. Um, you think about everything from oil and gas to wind and solar, um, the scale we have, the breadth, of our campus is special. Um, you take the consideration we're in Austin. Austin is wonderful. We're an innovation hub, a tech hub. So whatever we think about as far as a vision for sustainability should think about our, our what is differentiable in the language? What, what, do, what do we have at special? Texas, Austin, size, scale, breadth. Um, we also have an incredible alumni base, 530,000 living alums. So can we use them in different ways in, in our sustainability efforts? Can we have a more targeted way of go, trying to find alums who are working in the space who can help our students navigate their post-UT careers um, or help us adopt best practices more quickly. So I think, I think that's another area. So I, for me, it would be um, some combination of coming back to the, what we really want to do well is, is be you know, the, the, the best public university in the country and among the, the elite privates, but do it in our Texas way. And, and so that means coming back to what do we have as special as a, as a, as a university? I know that the committee will take that, that kind of uh, be interesting to frame things in that context. Um, what, what thank you, uh, if you have any closing comments, but thank you for sharing uh, the, the Sustainability and Leadership Institute uh, announcement with the, the Bake family, that's very uh, exciting. No, thank you, Jim. Thanks for all your work. And um, again, it's, it's nice to join everybody. I look forward to these things being back in person um 
the talking to a webinar screen with your own face on it is not as much fun. Um, so I look forward to, to seeing this evolve and these efforts evolve in the future and, and to being back together in person. And, and I, I know there's a lot of good work that's been done, is being done and will be done. So I'm really excited for the future. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, if there are other questions that come in, we'll look to answer those uh, next week. Yeah. Symposium. But thank you for your, for your time, uh, President Hartzell, and uh, have a good afternoon. And please stick around at uh, one o'clock. We'll have some student showcase um, for a little bit closed out of the symposium. Great. Enjoy the rest of it. Hook them. Hook them. <laughs>